Okay, I am very excited today. Uh, we have an actress here, a comedian, a, um, a disability advocate, a tap dancer. And um, she is, she's truly incredible. Uh, she is on General Hospital, Maysoon Zaid. There she is. Hello. Hi, David. Hello. Oh. I think you should be my hype man. I really like that intro. I feel like you believed in it. Like most people just rattle off the credits like they've memorized it like a phone book, but you, you put like an auctioneer soul in it. Like I thought oh. you really believed in me. You were like General Hospital. It was awesome. Oh, uh, well, I do believe it. I mean, I mean, you, you have a, you know, there's those people that just have that certain energy, that glow. And whenever I've seen you, it's like, <laughs> you know, because you have that power about you. It's like, I'm going to get this done, <laughs> you know? I'm a go-getter, yeah. By the way, I love, I wish I had your place wherever you are. Yeah, so I live on a, in a glass house on the Hudson River with an unobstructed view of New York City, but the um, rain has taken away my view. But normally I can see if there's traffic or not on the George Washington Bridge and when I should or shouldn't leave in the before time when I was allowed to leave. So one of the silver linings of being stuck since March 14th is okay. at least I live in a cliff and see like parrots and bluebirds and as I said, the Hudson River and Grant's tomb and all that jazz. Oh my God. Oh, and to be able to go outside, I like live in a third story, one bedroom apartment and it's like, you know, the front Oh wall. yeah, no, yeah. No, I'm really, really lucky. But there's a reason for this too, because I moved into New York City for 45 minutes once and it cost me $4,000 because I was working in the city all the time as a stand-up comic. I was taking acting classes. This was like right after college. I was like, I'm not gonna pay tolls anymore. I'm gonna move into New York City. And I moved into a building on the fourth floor and literally within 45 minutes, I was like, I'm a rat in a cage. I need a driveway. I need a backyard. And I went across the river to the Jersey side and got a giant glass house with a wraparound porch for oh. what you'd get a studio on 79th Street. Oh my God. Good for you. And if you ever need a roommate, <laughs> I'm I, do, I, I have a roommate, Beyonce the cat. Hopefully she'll make an appearance. Right oh, now. I love that. So <clears throat> when did you know that you wanted to be a stand-up comedian? I didn't know that I wanted to be a stand-up comedian. So my dream in life was to be on the daytime soap opera General Hospital. I went and stayed theater at Arizona State University, come back to Jersey and start auditioning, just pounding the pavement in New York City. I'm taking these intense drama classes at the neighborhood playhouse. I'm perching myself on a bench in Central Park or next to a building on Wall Street and weeping openly to see if I'm convincing, and I am. So I have no idea that I'm funny at this point. Right. And, um, I walked into an audition, I will never forget this in my life. It was like a seven floor walk up. So I dragged my palsy body up to the top of this building. Right. I walk in for my audition. I have like perfect Kardashian makeup. I'm ready for my close up. And the casting director, before I ever opened my mouth, just went, no, 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 no. Whatever this is, no. What? Yeah. <laughs> Come on, it's acting. Um, they don't oh. know what to do with a disabled person. They probably think I'm drunk because I don't use a wheelchair. So my cerebral palsy can be very confusing. A lot of people think I am drunk. And what's funny about that is I think if I drank, I would walk straight. Oh. But I can't find out because I'm Muslim and it's Ramadan. <laughs> oh, <wow. laughs> and Muslims don't drink, or at least we don't admit to it on random webcasts. Right. Um, so I was talking to my acting coach, Tanya Berzin, and she said, you have to show them what you can do. You need to do a one-woman show. Yeah. So I started studying one-people shows at the time. In, uh, Nia yeah, Rodales had gotten my big fat Greek wedding off of a one person show. I knew about Whoopi Goldberg's one person show, but then I saw John Leguizamo 
And when I saw John Leguizamo, I was like, oh, I don't want to do a one person show. I want to do comedy. So I signed up January 2000 yeah. for a comedy class at Caroline's Comedy Club in New York City. And the rest was literally history. And I went, I never went back to weeping on corners in New York City. Do you know, it's so interesting. Uh, that's such a great story because it reminds me of Streisand mm. because she wanted to act, but what got her in the door was her amazing her voice. voice. Yeah. So now what's this tap dance on Broadway? I have, I've tap danced on Broadway. It's all related to each other. So the reason I wanted to become a performer was because my parents couldn't afford physical therapy. So they sent me a tap class as the physical therapy and they sent me to piano as occupational therapy. So like for my hands, I do piano. And, and, and back in the day, because like, you know, I look super duper young, but like I come from when telephones were attached to the wall. Um, a tap class was probably like $5 a week and you would go to like three classes. Whereas physical therapy, you needed to pay like a hundred bucks. So that's what they sent me to. And that's where the performer in me came from. So I'm 12 years old. And by the way, um, anyone watching this can go to Audible and get my book, Find Another Dream. This is the perfect time for my shameless plug. I have a memoir called Find Another Dream. And it, the title is based on the story I'm about to tell you. Yeah. But also it comes with a downloadable PDF just in case anyone is deaf and can't listen or, you know, they want to multitask and listen while they, you know, read instead of watch. They yeah. can, instead of listen, they can do that. I mixed up like eight different ways to do things because pandemic <laughs> fog brain, which that I can't blame myself for. So I'm 12 years old. I go to a dance convention in New York City with my dance class. I'm doing tap solos. I'm getting standing ovations. I did an on-point solo to Bette Midler's Wind Beneath My Wings. Oh. A white costume. So I looked like a creepy disabled little child bride. It was horrifying. But I got a standing ovation. So I went to this convention. And we were being trained by these Broadway divas. And they taught us a number. And then <clears throat> they went around the room and they asked everyone, what's your dream? And like, they were cheering on the other kids who were like, I want to be a unicorn. And they're like, you go, Sally, you go, Karen. And they got to me and I said, I want to tap dance in Broadway's Bring in the Noise, Bring in the Funk. <laughs> the diva that was coaching me said, girl, you're a cripple, find another dream. And so that's how I got the title of my book, Find Another Dream, because I did. And my dream became being on General Hospital, which was much more realistic. So I become a stand-up comic. Yeah. I book a Live Nation tour called Arabs Gone Wild with my buddies Aaron Cater and Dean Obadala. One of the theaters that we're performing at is a Broadway theater on a Monday night. So before my comedy routine starts, I tap dance. So that I can say for the rest of my life, I tap danced on Broadway. Oh. In November, I was touring with Together Live with Abby Wambach, the soccer player, and Glennon and Doyle, who is like the most amazing author in all of Authorist. Yeah. And we again were at the Town Hall Theater, which is a Broadway theater. So again, I tap danced on Broadway. So now I get to say I've tap danced on Broadway several times. And I'm also apparently a best-selling author, which is really funny because I wrote this book for Audible and it was published by Hello Sunshine Reese Witherspoon's company. And I was so excited for my book party. I planned out like the whole thing. I'm like, there's going to be a bubble wrap red carpet. So that's like all popping and kind of sounds like Gaza when you walk. And then they were like, yeah, audiobooks are like kind of cheap and you don't get a party. So oh. I was like, all sad that I didn't get a party. And then I woke up on the bestseller list and I was on the bestseller list for six weeks. But wait, there's more. I beat Donald Trump Jr. Oh. I, was sixth. I was sixth and he was ninth. And I didn't even have an admitted sexual predator promoting my book on Twitter to <laughs> 60 million followers. Oh my God. Yeah, yeah, you're... Uh... 
And yeah, I'm, I, I, that's, <laughs> when I get off of this, I'm going to go to Audible and get your book. You should. It is a feel-good romp, but I must warn you, there's an entire chapter on cats that has elicited so much anger from non-cat people that listen to the book. <laughs> So like I have like all, you know five stars I'm four stars four stars is the maximum I have like all four stars four stars four stars and then like one star and the review is she talked about her cats for ten minutes ten whole minutes just about cats <laughs> like so if you don't like cats it's going to hurt your soul that one chapter but the rest of the book is a really like fun romp about everything I ever do goes horrifically wrong. And somehow I end up at the top and I'm not quite sure how. <laughs> well, I, th I love that you talked about cats. It's like a personal connection, you know? Oh, and yeah. a, lo a lot of people love cats. Well, the original title of my book was Who Shot My Cat? <laughs> but people didn't feel like it was enough because, yes, one of my cats did get shot. Oh, no. And not in Palestine, David, in Jersey. <sighs> By the book. By the way, the dream. oh my God. Audible.com. <laughs> How many languages do you know? I speak two languages fluently and one language really badly. So I speak Arabic and English fluently and I've been practicing ASL since college, but I'm palsy and I have a stutter. I'm not really good at it. Uh, I, can, I can read it better than I can speak it. Yeah, I've been, I, I've got to start doing that. I've been talking about it for years, but I just, um, I'm going to throw out a name and then whatever comes to your mind. Okay. Jerry Jewell. Oh, Trailblazer. So I didn't know that Jerry Jewell had cerebral palsy when I saw her on the Facts of Life. And I didn't identify with her at all. I identified with Joe, the tough tomboy who rode a motorcycle even though like I was not tough or tomboyish, I had a motorcycle and probably grind my poor limpy legs. But when Jerry Jewell resurfaced on Deadwood, I think she was a huge influence on who I became as an actor later in life because she was so fierce. She was so well in, in, ingrained in that show. She wasn't a special character, a side character, a guest character. She was part of Deadwood. And it gave me as like, a little American chick, the grounding of we've been here forever and we'll be here forever, even if you want to euthanize us. And as an actor, it showed me that I could be on like the best shows out there. Yeah, yeah. More names. Yeah, yeah. I am, um, I'm- Throw listening. another name. What? Oh, throw another name. Well, I, I want to tell you. Yeah. I want to tell you, your, your balls to the wall. I love how honest you are. Uh, you know, uh, <laughs> and and how how whatever you feel is like it's out there. Um, you, at Performing Arts Studio West, we have like a hundred students, and then of course the Meet the Biz program opens mm. it to all actors. Um, so if if you're going to talk to the students today because they're watching, and the Meet the Biz students are watching, and the the YouTube family is watching. What would you suggest on how to achieve what you want in life? You, you gotta be a hustler. So don't just do one thing. If you play piano amazingly, see if you can also paint sets for Broadway or if you can write jingles or if you can sing, don't just do one thing. So like I was an actor and if all I did was audition, get rejected, it would have broken me. But I was also a dancer. I was also a comedian. I was also a writer. Right now in the pandemic, the fact that I'm a writer is what's saving me because I got a deal to do um, a comic book series for eight to 12 year olds. And so all of my live shows have been wiped off the calendar until January, 2021. And because I had a side hustle of writing, I was able to get something that I could work on in this time. And you have to be better than everyone else. So a lot of people look at a performer and they say, I'm just as good as him. Why am I not there? Well, you gotta be better. And it's harder for people of color. So if you're not, cookie cutter, perfect. You know, I always used to say like Jennifer Aniston on Friends, 
if you have a disability, if you're transgender, if you're a person of color, if you're not super skinny, these things are all gonna work against you. It's not fair and it's light. So like you have to be better than the next person. Your talent has to be there when you walk in the door because you only get one chance. So you can't be like, nobody with disabilities ever gets on TV, this is so unfair, and then go into an audition and not have memorized the sides and be like fumbling with papers and looking at your feet. Like make sure that your talent is better than anyone else so that when you walk in that room or roll in that room, you know that you have what it takes and that it's not, I hope they see it. But that side hustle is so, so important. Find one or two things else that you have to be in arts. Maybe it's doing construction. Maybe it's, you know, doing shadow puppets that Ivanka Trump weirdly tweets about. I don't know. I guess shadow puppetry is like a genre now. <laughs> but learn how to make balloon animals. Like kids' parties are big money. If you know how to make a balloon animal and can rent an Elsa costume, you can make like thousands to bankroll the acting classes, the music classes, the tap classes, the auditioning classes. Watch tons of content. Watch the people you love, the people you admire, the people that you want to become like and see how they do it. See how they change. Are they chameleons? Is it always the same character? And write every single day. Even if you're not a writer, write every single day. It will tap into a part of your soul that is so necessary for performing. And if you are a performer, you could be writing a one woman show, you could be writing sketches, scripts, films, novel, memoir. If you're a comedian, you gotta write jokes. You gotta write jokes every single day, never stop. Wow, that's such good advice. I mean, I'm gonna, it, because I always wanna say, okay, I have to write, I have to pick up the pen or, you know, and I'm just drag my ass and I can't do it anymore. I mean, the science well, I mean, it's, There's an old book, it's called The Artist's Way. They tell you, you put the pen to the paper, you put your finger on the keypad and you just put, I don't know what to write, I don't know what to write, I don't know what to write. And then you're like, hey, it's raining. Oh my God, is it May? How did it get to May? Ooh, I've forgotten that it's Mother's Day. Oh, I have no children. Should I have had children before I can? And then like it all snowballs and then eventually you've written about something worth using. Wow, yeah. I have um, a, a few oh, people. Oh, I have one more piece of advice. Oh yeah, yeah. You have to listen to criticism. Do not be dismissive of criticism. Listen to criticism and then process what is worth taking in and what you just brush off your shoulders, right? So some criticism is valid, you learn from it, you grow from it. When I was doing stand-up comedy in the beginning, I used every slur in the book because my comedy idols like Eddie Murphy and Richard Pryor, they used slurs, so I was using slurs. And I had someone come up to me after a show and be like, you know, I just wanted to come out and laugh and you invoke the most painful, dark moment of my life. And I was like, oh, yeah, I don't want to do that. You know, that's not what I want to do. I want to make people laugh. Hey, can I do this without causing harm? Can I do it in a better way? And I learned how to do it in a better way. It wasn't that I was censored. It wasn't that I was criticized and I let them break me down. It was that their criticism made me a better comedian. But then like if someone comes up to me and is like, hey, I don't think it's funny that you make fun of Donald Trump and you should probably leave this country if you don't love it. I don't go, oh, I should probably not make fun of Donald Trump. But maybe I should book a ticket to New Zealand. I brush it off and I move on. So know which criticism is worth taking in and which criticism you just block, mute, delete. Mm hmm Yeah. Shouldn't I, I have a TV show, David? And yet I don't. Oh my God! I could. I would. You should have a talk show host every day. I'd like turn it I on. I know. I've been flying. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God! I have uh, a couple of people sent in from the class. Um, okay. That I, I email and I say, "Hey, everybody! This is going to be our guest. Any questions?" So we have a okay. few here. Um, Ramjani. Uh, Oh, let's start. Yadira Cauldron. 
She says, how can we get into the mainstream media to respond and share our stories? A variety, not only the stories of those with access to decision makers. I don't know, when you figure it out, let me know. <laughs> I've, been, I've been trying to get booked nonstop. It's Ramadan right now, I'm Muslim. And I'm like, come on, everybody's doing stuff virtually. There's gotta be someone who wants to put me on one of these news networks or on Good Morning America, or the viewer, the talk to discuss what it's like to be fasting during a pandemic or what it's like to be a Muslim in a country where you're told by the most powerful people to go back home. And, and I don't get that exposure. I lucked out and I get to be on CNN about like once a month, but it's very difficult to break in. The one way that makes it easier is if you write an article for like Vice, Daily Beast, Refinery29, about a subject that's newsworthy, and you have an article to show when you pitch whatever it is you're pitching, mm -hmm. that'll open the door for you more than just being like, hey, I'm an expert on tap dancing. And they're like, okay, show me. And I don't have anything written. I don't have an anthology. Write and pitch articles before you write and pitch appearances. Beautiful. Beautiful. Oh, and those things don't pay, by the way. Media appearances are free. You don't right. get paid to go on CNN to talk about the disability vote. Right, right. But it gets, your, it gets you out there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All, all, all I, I have a balance of paid work and non-paid work. Yeah. And my non-paid work is getting me out there so that I can book paid work or that non-paid work is giving me the practice I need. Like for example, doing this with David right now is giving me the practice that I need to maybe do an interview with Colbert virtually tomorrow if he decides to do it. Of course, of course. Um, you have better hair. Uh, oh, who? Oh, yeah, yeah, than me. You do. <laughs> no, you have better hair than. Oh, Colbert. I do. Yeah. Oh, thank you. You have oh, a hundred percent. Listen, if you were a, a helicopter looking down, you wouldn't say that. <laughs> Um, okay, where's uh, our final question? Because I have a 115 I have to run. Wonderful. Through. Well, Rajani, Way, uh, Rajani uh, uh, Reyes says, what does your name mean to you? It's very, uh, it seems very special. So all Arabic names have meanings. And when your parents don't know the meaning of your name, they lie to you. So if you're a girl, they tell you it means a beautiful flower. But it's a flower only in the heaven, and that's why you never saw it. And if you're a boy, they tell you it means lion, roar, habibi, roar. So I thought May soon meant beautiful flower in heaven. And then when I was 23, I met an Iraqi linguist and found out May soon means lemur, as in the small monkey. My parents basically named me Zabumafu. Well, it's beautiful. It's a beautiful animal. I, like I it. love it. And so are you. You're just, I hope you could come someday uh, to visit our studio in person in, in, uh, in LA. Diana Elizabeth Jordan's there. She'd love to interview you. And I you would love, see. love to visit the studio. I'm yeah. a teacher at heart, so I would love that. Well, thank you. It, it shows. It shows. Thank you. Everybody can find me on maysoon.com. Just like the month of May is coming soon.com, maysoon.com. If you forget that, palsy Palestinian, I'm the first one that pops up. Thank you, everybody. My advice to young girls and women of color is you have to work harder and you'll make it. And like, don't look for people and say, I need to compete with that person or become that person. Only compete with yourself because you will never, ever be able to compete with privileged mediocrity.